We'll begin our study with a prayer, and then I'll jump in with our topic for today. We'll pray. Lord, give us hearts that seek you first. Help us to see all of the, the blessings that you have poured into our lives, but not to turn these blessings into our idols and to set our hearts on them. Instead, by seeking you first, give us a properly ordered life that puts into the right priority um, the responsibilities you give us and the, the people and the things that you entrust to us. Uh, bless our, our study of your word today and um, help us to find in you our hope, our peace, our security, and all that we need. Amen. All right. Here we go. We are in, in the first commandment today. Uh, we have an exciting topic. I think I revealed it last week. Our, our goal is to see how politics can become our idol. And so someone said that somehow I drew the short, the, the short straw by having to, to tackle politics. And I guess, well, as we approach the topic, we'll have to um, be honest with ourselves and, and go through it. Here's where I want to get you fired up right from the beginning. What comes to your mind when you see this? Uh, does this does this uh, fill you with uh, good feelings or does it make your blood boil um, yeah we can we can change that and we can put up this one too and and there we've covered the the two spectrums of um, of cable tv right <laughs> do you watch cnn do you watch fox news we don't get cable so i don't have this problem but um you could see how this topic is one that that easily not only divides but one that um, could cause rifts in, between Christians as well. So when we look at at the issue of politics, this is how I want to start us out today, and I think it's a, a good thing for us to always consider as we look at any of these uh, subjects on the first commandment. Jesus' words from Matthew chapter seven. Actually, next week I'll be doing the sermon on the um, basically the same words from the Gospel of Luke. So Jesus said, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take out the plank, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I think this is so important as we look at these, um, at, at this subject of how politics can become an idol because the, the natural instinct of us is to see how it has become the idol for someone else. Or to take our aim at how the other side, especially if, if we are one who is uh, deeply involved in keeping track of politics or, or very um, aware of it, um, to see how the other side has erred instead of seeing how have I turned this into an idol or have I, returned, have I turned it into an idol? And, I make the point we can only repent for our, our own sin, not for someone else's sin. So it does no good, really, to spend your time today thinking about how others may be falling into this, this trap of turning in uh, politics or politicians or political systems into an idol of sorts. It does no good to, to say, wow, um, that's how they're doing it. It really does only good for you to look in your own heart and say, have I done this? And what is the, the result of that? And how do I, as a Christian, um, first take this sin and put it before the Lord, uh, re repenting of it, asking for forgiveness, and then we'll use part of our time today also to say, what does it look like for Christians to have a proper attitude towards politics, politicians, political systems, political parties, all of that? What we're not going to do is spend, we don't have time to spend saying, you know, what is the, um, you know, the proper place of government and how does scripture speak of, of the two kingdoms, God's kingdom and, and, and the, the kingdom um, of this world or the or government? So we don't have time to, to delve into those things. Really, we're looking at the heart and how we might turn politics, po politicians, political systems, political parties into our God. And remember that as we, we talk about a God, we're not talking about a statue, although um, sometimes it, it seems that politics can get to the point where where politicians or systems are almost worshipped in that same way. But um, seeing that an idol is anything that makes a promise that only God can truly make and keep. So that's our definition of an idol. And it's something that we, we would look to. And 
we look to it to, to give us something that only God can give. What I want to do is start out today by looking at this and a, a big, I guess, the bigger picture. What are the false promises that the right political system or party or politician hold out? So what is it that is so attractive that we as, as, as um, really as not just Americans, but I, I think this is around, uh, or certainly around our world, it is perhaps more of, an, of a thing right now where we have democracy and we can participate in our government. If you were, if you were living under um, a king and had no say, you might not, you might not be as, um, well, put as much hope in change or something like that because you're just stuck. But we do. So what are the false promises that, that people are looking to that really get, get a lot of people um, fired up about um, politics, politicians, whatever it may be? What are the false promises? Do you understand what I mean by that? Okay, I'm going to make a list here. So uh, security, yes. And of course, there, the answer is if we have the right government, perhaps we, um, we will be secure. And of course, there's always, a, there is truth in, in these false promises. It's not that they're completely false. It's that they don't have the ability to fulfill the promise in the fullest sense. So yes, there is security. Um, that the government provides. That's one of its purposes, but it's not one that it can provide without, um, in, in the, the fullest way. Equality. Um, hunters, you're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to help me out with free stuff because I don't know exactly what you mean by that. Uh, what, what's behind that? Um, all right. Solve uh, society's problems. Let's, so let's, let's look at that. Um, let's see here. So equality, the Ritters have equality. Yeah, if we can only, um, if we only have the right system or the right politicians or the right party, then that we would be equal. And I think there's this lure of equality that, the allure of it that, of course, we're thinking about our, ourselves probably first, no, maybe not always, but um, that would be the the ideal, and that, that's a loaded word. We don't have time to go into it, but equality is certainly a loaded word as to what, what people mean by that and how um, God's word would speak about equality. There's, yeah, I remember a conversation I had with a member in California about that word and just how, how much you have to unpack it. Um, all right. Uh, okay, we can only worship God in our democracy, so... Um, yeah, it even might be that our, our, our faith is tied to our way of government. So I'm, I don't know how to write that. Faith tied to, as if, 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 as if to be a Christian is equivalent in some way to our American way of, of governing. Um, a Christian nation. Greaves, you want to you wanna expound on that? And you can even unmute yourself if you want. So I guess what I what I meant was that like if you get the all the right laws in, then we've got a Christian nation where maybe you have the right laws, but it's not really more Christian. Okay, yeah, I think that's an imp that's a, that's a interesting an interesting one because we would say, of course, the ideal of a Christian nation sounds very good in in many ways. And yet here's the question, and one of the, the secret angles of, of this idol of, of, of political systems or parties or however you want to put it, that somehow the government can mandate Christianity. And of course, the, the lie there is that you can, with a law, turn someone into a Christian as if it's a moral code that makes someone a Christian and not faith in Jesus. That's, um, that is a really appealing notion that if we only had the right government, the right laws, the right Supreme Court, the right Congress, we would have a Christian nation again. And I think that's one that we have to be, be careful about um, 
And you have to ask yourself, have we ever truly been a Christian nation? I think there's some nostalgia in that. And if you look at our country's history, it's never been a Christian nation in the sense that, um, that, that somehow it's only been Christians or that even the majority uh, have been practicing Christians. We've always had a nation of, of um, people where Christianity certainly had an influence, but our founding fathers were not necessarily Christian, even if they were influenced by Christian morality. Um, they were more deists, if, I, if I'm thinking correctly. And that means they, they held up certainly ideals of the Bible, but not the gospel, not, not Jesus. Let's, I want to make sure I didn't miss any. Um, solve, yeah, solve society's problems. I'm not sure I mentioned that one, but maybe that's, the, that's at the heart of this, that, that all of our problems can be solved by the government or solved by the right government, the right politician. And we have to, we have to, or the right political system, because it might be, the problems can't be solved by the government, but that's the problem. It, it's the political system that we have to um, hold on to. And there we have to really be careful because if, if all of the problems can be solved by the government, then we have ultimately created a false sense of what the, the problem really is and we create a false savior without a need for Jesus, but rather a need for the right political system. Good. Uh, fairness, let's get that. Fairness and equality and fairness, I think, um, right. And of course, fairness is a tough one because we, we tend to see only the good in what others have, and we, and we uh, compare ourselves to it, and we say that's not fair, but we, we often miss what we have, and we, we really aren't in a position to judge. All right. Um, I shouldn't have to pay my money, my food, uh, pay my money for food. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how to put that. If I don't know if the government here would be the false promise of, of um, pro provision in every way, as if God is not our provider, but, but only the government. Who, uh, because of the Christian nation, concept. So in China, there's the idea that all Americans are Christian. Is that what you're, you're um, saying, Dolan Faith? Okay. So this idea that we are a Christian nation. Yeah, that's a really interesting perspective. I haven't, I haven't um, spent enough time outside the country to realize how the world thinks of us. And I'm sure that's different around the world. Um, but certainly God has played a part in the way that we as, as Americans have, have spoken. And, and yet, I'm not sure that we as Christians, I'm sure actually that we shouldn't equate any speak of God with, with Christianity. The two are not equivalent. To say that we are a nation under God says nothing about who this God is. And we have to be careful to think, uh, to not think that simply being a nation under God and yet not describing who this God is somehow makes us a Christian nation. Um, yeah, what are the other systems? I'll, I'll, provision, I think, covers this. Oh, I, you know, my whatever my problem may be, if it's debt, I can. The, the government is the answer to get out of that. Um, the government is the one that will will make sure that we have security because of that. Good. Now, obviously, the government does have a, a role to play in many of the things we mentioned. Uh, think about it, security. Well, the government has a God-given responsibility to provide for security of the body, but it cannot provide for a security of the soul. It has nothing to say about um, security beyond the welfare of the body. Equality or fairness or equity or those kinds of things, the government has a, a, a role to play in that, and yet you know that human hearts are what they are and will always be looking to get ahead of the other. That's the sinful nature. And that's really one of the interesting things about um, economic systems. If you, we don't want to get into a huge discussion about it, but why, why does capitalism um, work? Well, it's not because people are, are, are good. It's because they're greedy and they look out for their own, their own gain. Um, and that's, that's why it's a system that has produced wealth, but it's also produced uh, great inequality because of the, the greediness of, um, of people. And as we look at it, 
those are hard things as, as we consider them from a Christian perspective. Um, good. Anything else that you want to add to this list? I think we, we hit quite a few. I think it's easy for, for um, this idea of like heaven on earth, if we only had the right system, the right politicians, then all of the problems that we currently face will be, will be gone. How much hope is placed in an election? And I'd, I'd love to hear from our, our experienced people that are online um, who've lived through all of this change in the elections and every election cycle, so there's this renewed hope, and yet how much actually ever changes? Not that governments can't make good decisions that will benefit society, but in the end, it seems that every age is plagued by, um, plagued by more and more sin and strife. And so that we would put hope in an election to change somehow everything, I think, is, is misplaced hope. And actually, I would argue that if you are looking to the government to supply what um, all these things, then you've missed how God has called you to, to be in your own home, uh, the king or the queen or whoever it is, to, to make sure that in your home, that is, what, that is what's happening. And also, I also think it's interesting that the presidential election is such a hot thing when, I don't know, how much impact does, can the, the president of the United States have? Um, obviously setting the tone for the country and things like that are, are important, but local elections are probably more important if you want to think about it. All right, we're going to move on and uh, good, good ideas there. One pastor suggests the following diagnostic questions to see if you're worshiping the idol of politics. Again, as we go through this, we have to look to our own hearts. I'm not going to scroll through your Facebook pages. I'm not going to um, look at who you're supporting or what signs you have in your front yards uh, as far as which um, party or, or which candidates you might be supportive of. But you have to look at your own heart and say, am I turned politics into an idol in some way? And here are, here are some questions that one pastor at least was suggesting. Can you admit that there are going to be flaws in your preferred political party, political leader, or ideology? So are you aware that there is no such thing as the perfect party um, leader or ideology and be able to acknowledge that as opposed to defending every action or every stance of, of um, any system, that there's always flaws because they come from flawed people? Do you feel as though life only has hope and meaning if your particular side of an issue is moving towards greater power and influence? That this is the great, the great battle that if you were to rewrite, rewrite Ephesians chapter 5, Paul would write, your struggle is not against flesh and blood, it's against political movements and being on the right side of an issue. Do you feel like the primary solution to the problems of the society is new political leadership? As if, if we only had a new person up, on, up, up in, in charge, then somehow um, the problems of society will, will subside. And of course, when, I, when I, we ask that question, the primary solution, the primary solution, so it's not as if that can't be part of a solution, but it, it, is it the primary solution? Can you think of other questions that, that would be good diagnostics for a Christian to, to ask himself or herself? whether or not idolatry has become um, something that we have slipped into without even recognizing? Any other questions that you might ask? Do you tie your happiness to who's in power? Yeah. Have, have you been miserable for four years um, or three and a half years with Trump as president? Or have you been completely ecstatic and feeling like um, America's great again, you know, because of, of the person who's in, in charge? Um, yeah, how much time are you spending talking about it? That's a, that's a hard one because, of course, if you're not into sports, and people can talk about sports for, for hours, um, politics is the other, you know, the other thing. Oh, yeah, I was going to make a joke at the beginning of the class, and I forgot. My joke was going to be this. Today, we're going to talk about the two things we're not supposed to talk about, politics and religion, in the same time. And here we go. Um, 
Does your faith bend to, to fit your politics? Or does your politics bend to fit your faith? Yeah. Um, where is your allegiance? And, and sometimes I think what we need is someone to come in from the outside and say, this is what I'm seeing. And help us to see what perhaps we are unable to see as far as are we trying to, to um, as we look through scripture, do we find reason to support every political position we already have? Instead of saying, what does scripture call me to be? And how do I then as a Christian um, make decisions with, with my voting or my, my support, knowing that often, or most often we are not making um, decisions based on um, you know, oftentimes it's the least, the least worst option. We're, we're doing our best knowing that there's no perfect answer. How much time? I think we talked about that. Um, your happiness. Yeah. There is something about, I didn't say, I said, I wasn't going to look at your Facebook page, but I think how, how uh, fired up do you get? Um, is this a life or death uh, uh, issue in your mind as if this is what it comes down to that if, if someone knows you, they know you first as a Republican or first as a Democrat and not as a Christian. Um, that's your identity on maybe on social media or, or around people. As far as the, the time you spend talking, it might just be the time you spend listening to what is, what is your source of, of truth? Is it, is it, um, listening, for hours on end to cable news, to talk radio, to whatever it may be, reading blogs about. Now, obviously we wanna be informed, but at some point we have to check ourselves and say how, how um, have we become not just informed, but now obsessed about, about one thing. Ask yourselves these questions. This is, some, this is the work you have to do in this study. I can't do it for you, um, but really, ask yourself these questions because they'll reveal what, um, what, what you alone can know in your own heart. Let's move on. As we, as we think about this, now every sin, of course, has a consequence tied to it. And if that's true, then this would be the case also if politics have become an idol for someone. So what, what harm is done if a Christian has turned politics into an idol? You might not identify that it's an idol but maybe you see the harm that it's caused in your own life, your own faith, or in the lives of others. And of course, those are the two areas that we have to focus on is my own life, perhaps how have politics become something that have, have um, been detrimental, detrimental to my faith, or have they become a stumbling block to others in their faith? So what, what, what is the possible harm that's done if politics or politicians or political parties or systems have become an idol to us? All right, um, relationships, yeah. Now, when it comes to relationships and politics, obviously I joked, you know, you don't talk about religion, you don't talk about politics with people because you don't wanna ruin the relationship. And um, it's, it's true that politics can divide people. And I think Thanksgiving dinner is like the classic example where you go to Thanksgiving dinner and there you have around the table this smattering of, of people from all sorts of political positions and, and, um, and then it turns to politics and people get upset and throw food at each other or something like that. Certainly if we're getting angry at, at people and the reason is not for um, righteous reasons but because of political positions, then we have to check our hearts and find out if we have turned this into our God. Um, Jesus said that, that there will be strife in relationships because of him. And I, I guess I hope that if there are strife in our relationships, it's because of him and not because we have equated a particular party or politician to following him. Um, so, uh, yeah, the Antichrist. And now, when we think of the Antichrist, obviously, you're thinking of 
the Antichrist, I'm going to put Antichrist, I'm going to make it small a2, and know that in 1 John, John talks about Antichrists, plural. You probably think when we say Antichrist, you, you are thinking of um, 1 Thessalonians or, and the, the talk of, of the one who sets himself up in the place of God, and probably then the papacy, the Roman papacy as the Antichrist. But first John talks about antichrists as that which um, denies Christ. And ultimately the word antichrist means to stand in the place of Christ, which would be an idol. And so I think we can list, list that there. Um, what harm is done if a Christian has turned politics into an idol? Fight against the opposition. So, yeah, how do I how do I want to put that? Um, I'm going to say lack of love for others. I mean, that's maybe the what you're getting at, Paul. Um, lack of love for others, where you you turn others who who are of the other party, perhaps, into your enemy, or politicians as um, the enemy, and as if that is what makes someone you know the two the two the two parties are not those who are of god and those who are not maybe that's how you make sense of it but how do you love someone with whom you are um you you see as the opposition or or even hate what, what harm is done when the idol falls um so if politicians or politics have have become an idol then of course the the danger is that that idol will break the promise and so um, you have you have the disappointment of it never working out the way you hoped it to it would that the politician doesn't follow through or that the change doesn't happen and if you've turned someone into God and that God that God cannot be God then you are going to live with constant disappointment which I think is part of the reason that we're always looking for someone new and it never gets old to look for the next big um, the, the next big persona in politics because we're hoping that the Messiah comes and if only the right mix of a person um, would appear and have the right the right charisma the right positions and then that person would be the one to, to, to deliver the change that we look we're looking for okay what what other harm overrides opportunities to witness so yeah, um, that's what the Brandies, the Brandies pointed out. Yeah, lose opportunities. This one's interesting because that can happen in a number of ways. It could happen personally, obviously. If your your primary identity is a political one, then you might not have an opportunity to connect with people who um, see you as an enemy, perhaps, for holding on to a, pos a position. And if they never see you as as something more than just a supporter of this party or this politician, then perhaps you will never have an opportunity to, to know them and to witness to them. So if we expect unbelievers to live as, well, as unbelievers, then we would expect them to um, hate those of the other party or whatever, to see them as the enemy. These would be the things that we would expect. But from Christians, we expect not not this uh, turning into enemy, those who have different positions, but uh, love and what, what does love do? It speaks the truth in love. The other thing about that is if churches get involved in politics, this is a hard one because of course, we also have to be careful not to, to say that, um, you know, there are certain topics that are off limits because they become politicized when they are not political issues in and of themselves, they're moral issues to which God's word speaks. So if we think of, of um, the big ones today, um, abortion, um, homosexuality, or marriage. What would be other ones? Um, certainly, um, I, maybe those are the two social issues that come to mind first. There's probably more. You'll probably, you could put them in the, the chat box. And as a church, we do have a stance. It's not a political stance. It's a, it's a stance on scripture. And Yet we can politicize it, or it could be turned into a political um, a, a political point, and 
there's a balance there. Obviously, the gospel is what ought to define the church, and the gospel is for sinners. And so how do we as a church navigate this? There's been studies that say young people have turned away from churches because of political, they, they feel like they've become too politicized. I think that happens when a church gets behind a particular party and says, this is the party of, of, of Christians. This is the party of God or the of a particular candidate. This is the party, this is the um, candidate that God wants. And there you've, you've um, crossed the line, I think, because we've, we've no longer said, these are the issues that God's word speaks to specifically, but now we've become political and telling people how they, they ought to uh, vote or, or how they ought to manage themselves as, as members of society. When I keep going, we forget who God is, okay? Um, yeah, we might still talk about God, but, um, but in our lives, it's as if God doesn't exist. We, we are more hopeful in what the government can do. Taint view of Christianity because our words and actions, um, yeah, if our words and actions do not reflect Christ, then how can we be his, his witnesses in the world? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that here. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, lose opportunities to witness by, by uh, lives that don't reflect Christ. That would be a loss. People, make certain people feel unwelcome in our church. I think that's some of what I was saying with lose opportunities to witness. Yeah, and this is certainly something that as, um, you know, as we think about our church and our, the makeup of a congregation, what makes us a body is Christ. And if we say it's no, it's, it's an allegiance to a particular party, then we have um, turned that party into God. Of course, every party has its faults. Okay, uh, assuming if you support one party over another, you can't be a Christian. So I'm going to put equate um, the party with, uh, with Christianity. So, of course, I should put in, I should put in quotations, the party. And it could be Republican, it could be Democrat. There are Christians that are very firm in both, um, at least those who identify as Christians say, I'm a Christian and this is the party of the Christian, of the true Christian. And that's, that is a dangerous thing to say that being a part of this party is what makes you a Christian because like I said, every party has its faults, even as there are things that might attract us to a particular party. Um, racial justice, can I ask a question about this? So, I, sorry, sorry, that was, those are kind of old. That was from when you were listing up topics. Oh, okay. Sorry. But but I do have a kind of a question about what you were talking about at that time, about like the the, the politics in church question the yeah. issue, like so it seems like there's a, like there's a natural overlap because there's like Christianity comes with like a set of values right but it's, and then but politics also has um, a lot of it's kind of based on like a, like values and that kind of that kind of thing so that so. In some ways, can't the church maybe be promoting uh, like political idolatry by not by kind of checking out of of polit potentially politically charged issues, and then basically not giving guidance, not giving sure. discipleship? Is that a risk? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, and that's that's a hard thing to wrestle with um, when you think about. Well, right now, <laughs> there's there's great division in our country, and, and a lot of issues have become politicized from COVID nineteen to um, George Floyd and um, all these things. That what what does it look like to be a Christian, or, or maybe what does the church do right now? And the the challenge, of course, is that there are political positions that um, have been taken and have inevitably have some good in them and yet there's baggage if you said you know I, i'll i'll delve into the black lives matter um black lives matter as as uh, something well should that be something that as as a church we we say we are for this or not well the problem is black lives matter is 
is not as it's not just a statement it's also a, a movement there's a political movement and there's uh, baggage there to the movement beyond just saying black lives matter as a, a statement of truth that that african american lives matter that's there is more to it that i think um we have to be aware of that it it has baggage to it what can we say as a church we ought to say that that we should be standing up for the the uh, the poor for the um the those who are in society are have been pushed aside there's no question that what does that look like is my is the hard thing that we wrestle with what does that look like and as a church what i don't think we would be helpful is to say that looks like prescribing the action it certainly looks like being a good neighbor to those who who are your neighbors who you come across who are um, in your community and loving them but does it mean you have to be part of this this particular movement or something like that or take a political stance in some way these are hard things and yes the the church certainly can remain silent to its detriment and the the challenge i think is how do we speak god's word without binding consciences um, to a particular political movement or ideology uh, ideo um, ideology and so there is this balance that I think that 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 has to take place. Um, you know, what I don't like is if someone says, you know, if you bring up something like abortion or um, you know racial justice or something, that's a political you, that doesn't belong in church because that's political, or inequality is political. Well, these are also issues that are moral, and Scripture says a lot about them, and so. I don't, you know, I don't like the idea that anything that has a political, um, is contentious in the political world has to stay out of church because that's not, that's not accurate, that we as Christians have to wrestle with these things. So I don't know. I wish we could have a conversation in person because it's really hard for me just to talk at a screen and not have any feedback uh, and not, not see, you know, not be able to clarify my comments even if someone doesn't understand exactly what I mean. Um, so, the answer, short answer, grieves is yes, the church, if remaining silent, can also um, be at fault. And then I don't know if that's a political thing as much as just trying to avoid stepping on toes, which, which of, of course, Jesus doesn't step on toes. He, he crushes hearts. <laughs> he, he calls us to repent. Um, so any, any other clarification? And what I what I just said, kind of off the cuff. All right. What other what other harm can be done? I think we've we've um, we've made a pretty good list, and you see that it is harmful. And maybe that's the point: is that it does bring harm to those who equate a political movement or politician or party to to God, and. What happens maybe most of all is Christ is diminished. This is the this is the, the the sad thing. If you have become, let's say, the poster child for the Republican Party, and that is who you are at your core, um, where 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 is Christ in in that identity? Um, if you equate the one to the other, if you have have said you know the the um, Democratic Party stands for all that I stand for. Well, how, how can you give glory to Christ being tied so closely to a party where that party um, is not is not a party that, that can represent a Christian and a Christian point of view wholly? Neither can the Republican Party. No party can. Every party has its, its emphasis that Christians can say, I'm on board with this. I think the Democratic Party on the whole has has said we want to we want to support those who are um, who don't have, and at least this I mean I'm not going to get into political discussions, but that seems to be what what a lot of um, a lot would would say in the Republican Party on the whole, you know, saying we we support life and and yet it's it's really not that simple and not and nothing is so God's word of right versus wrong can get subordinated to some sinful opinion, yeah. You know, so caution, I would, I would, I would um, urge caution when it comes to po politics and especially to, to um, 
to, to equating a party or a position to your faith. So there is harm. Now, when it comes to Christians and politics, I think it's helpful to say, what is, what is our call? This is from Luther's Table of Duties. And what does it say to us as citizens? Just taking scripture, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. All right. It is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their time full-time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe him taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Um, so we owe a respect to our government, whether they are of our uh, stripe or not. When I, th I think about that, and what does that mean, respect? Is it possible that Christians badmouth their leaders, not just because they disagree with their policies, but because they want to um, win a political battle, an argument, and in, in doing so are not respecting those who are in authority? You've, you know, and you can, you can s sincerely disagree with someone um, and still love them, and yet make it clear that you disagree with their position. I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior. Are we praying for our leaders? Um, not just praying that they get kicked out of office, but praying for them, whoever they may be. Remind the, the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. So this idea that Christians would submit to the governing authorities and that we would um, do so, praying that God would bring peace through them. The Bible was not written in a time where, where the average citizen had any say in government. And so it's interesting that this is not this is not if you have someone you agree with in office. This is like someone who has no voice is being called to submit to the government. Now, I think the other beautiful thing that scripture does for us is it points us to our enduring citizenship, which only then can we be in a position to, to be good citizens and godly citizens now. I know we're out of time, but I'm just going to, I want to finish with these words. All these people, and this is the Hebrews um, Hall of Faith passage. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they'd been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to, to, to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, and for he has prepared a city for them. This, this word city in, um, I'm not sure, my, yeah, is polis in Greek. And the idea of, of the polis, the city, um, is one that for Romans would have brought to mind the ideal polis, the, the Rome. And yet, here writing to the Hebrews and possibly to Christians in Rome, um, the idea that you have a city and it's an enduring city, one not of this world. If we don't live as if everything depends on here and now, but that everything depends on Christ, then we are in the best position to say what is best uh, for the here and now instead of trying to make heaven on earth. That is a beautiful section. Are we living as aliens and strangers on earth? Um, is, that, is that how we live? Um, and we can because of Christ. Uh, Philippians 3, you've heard this passage, and I'll just jump to verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven, right? That's where we find our home. And, and right now, of course, we are living with um, in a world where it's not governed by, by the gospel, but, but we are to be governed by the gospel above all. And that informs the way then that we operate in this world. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Do we believe that? And are we trying to cre recreate a kingdom of, of God here on earth? No law can do it. No right government can do it. Only the gospel can make you a part of God's kingdom. And thank God that we are a part of that kingdom. Um, 
we don't have time to, to jump into this, but something for you to think about. When our hearts are fixed on Jesus and we know our citizenship is with him, we are in a position to be good citizens on earth. What will that look like in our American context? Um, I want you to think about that. What does it look like to be a good citizen? And I, I think that the call to be a neighbor is at the heart of that, a good neighbor to those whom God has put. And that informs how we vote. It informs certainly how we interact with people. Uh, but that's something that we, we ought to wrestle with. Yes, um, idea of patriotism. I, you know, there's, there's a lot more I'd love to talk about. I would love to talk about flags in church at some point. <laughs> uh, we don't have flags in our church at Our Redeemer, but I, I, I think that's an interesting conversation. Um, does the American flag belong in the Christian church? And um, so if, if, you, if you want, we can, you know, stop. I mean, yeah, we'll have that conversation someday. But this is a section I want to close with from Psalm 33. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the sides of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. The horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death, to keep them alive in famine. We, hate, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Those are, are beautiful words to stop by. You know, when it says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, it is speaking to Israel there, obviously. And Israel was called to, to be a nation um, set apart by God. And they were blessed when they pursued the Lord. Certainly it's true that a nation that, that is uh, filled with Christians ought to be a nation that um, is blessed by God because of because Christians will be good citizens but that doesn't mean that God has chosen a particular nation on earth now and certainly we can't say that he's chosen our nation somehow uh, at the same time we, we pray that our hope would be in him and seek to give him glory as we operate in this world in the political realm and um, all those things so thanks for joining us I think it would have been better in person where we could have had it back and forth but um, someday we'll get there someday God, God bless you in the meantime, and um, if you have any follow-up questions, certainly feel free to reach out. This really was a lesson that needed back and forth, um, but so much for that right now. We'll get there someday. So good to see you all, and um, yes, we'll hopefully see you again soon.